Hello. How are you? Hey, doing well. How about you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm Sherry. Hey, I'm, I'm, well. I'm going to be your moderator. <laughs> Great. I appreciate that. How are things? Good. Busy, but it's Friday and it's hey. warm here. Which oh, is okay. Like Where are you at? North Carolina. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I'm down in Houston. So it's always warm, except for when it freezes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right Possibly there. in the same week. <laughs> yeah, did you? Were you hit hard by that? Or? Um, you know, I mean, well, I mean, the 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 freezing temperatures. It, it was inconvenient. We lost electricity for about, I guess, thirty six hours, Ooh. but um, we were fortunate. We didn't have any major damage. You know, nothing significant other than just inconvenience and some landscaping. You know. Okay. Well, I'm I'm glad it wasn't worse than it could have been. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I know you have, y'all are a group of three. Let's see and see if everybody's. <laughs> Looks like we have two Merediths right now. So yes. <laughs> we <may have> extra. <laughs> I think the rest of us become obsolete. What? Yes, yes, I, I, I think I'm obsolete now. Two Merediths is definitely better than a Meredith and a Will. Oh, so. is, oh the, one of them is the captioner, or maybe? Uh, no, I'm going to set Rebecca up as the captioner right now that she's in. Rebecca, hang tight, and I'm going to get you set up with that. Okay, Rebecca, you should have your privileges now for captioning. And good afternoon, everyone. We will be starting shortly. We wanted to give everybody time to filter into the session. Good afternoon. Happy Friday to everyone. Indeed. <laughs> and at least in some places, uh, in we're in DC, we're having nice spring weather today. I hope you guys are having uh, nice, yeah. nice weather around Texas. Yeah, it's okay. It's better than it was a, a few weeks ago, a month ago. So. <laughs> it's all right. Hey, we're on the cusp of spring break here, so we're, we're looking good. Nice. Okay, so I have 2.15. I know y'all have a full schedule, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. So good afternoon and welcome to this session titled, How Would You Teach If Copyright Wasn't in the Way? Reimagining Open Education with the Best Practices in Fair Use and Fair Dealing for Open Education. Your presenters today are Meredith Jacob, the Public Lead for Creative Commons USA and the Director of the Project on Copyright and Open Licensing at the American University Washington College of Law. Peter Yazzie, Professor Emeritus at the American University Washington College of Law. Prue Adler, Senior Policy Fellow at the American University Washington College of Law. And Will Cross, Director of the Copyright and Digital Scholarship Center at the North Carolina State University Libraries. My name is Sherry Ransdell and I'll be your session moderator. Before we begin, let me remind everyone that a survey will be sent out later this afternoon after the conference ends. Please complete and submit this survey. Your feedback is very important to the planning process for next year's conference. Also live captioning is provided for all concurrent and plenary sessions. Um, to access captioning, attendees will have to click the CC button in the lower right side of their Zoom screen as captions do not appear automatically. And finally, I'll be moderating the chat, so be sure to post any questions there and the presenters will take those later in the session. Presenters, I think we're ready to begin. Great, thank you so much for having us and thank you to everybody who's taken time uh, this week on Thursday and Friday to come to Open Texas. So my name is Meredith Jacob, and today what we're going to talk about is how you would teach and how you would create OER if copyright was not in the way, and hopefully uh, reassure you that it may not be as much in the way as it has seen in the past, that rumors of it being in the way are vastly exaggerated. So what we're going to cover sort of throughout the 45 or 50 minutes we're together is first to explain why we think you probably need both materials that are included under fair use, as well as content that is licensed under a Creative Commons license to create the highest quality and most effective OER. Why you can't sort of use the CC licenses to leave copyright behind. The second thing we're gonna talk about is a little bit about 
what this code of best practices is, how it was created, how to use it, and what uh, principles were identified, and then how to use it in different examples of teaching, such as teaching foreign language, teaching history, and teaching other subjects where you really have to engage with things that are out there in the world. So to begin with, I want to talk about the sort of different buckets of content that you may draw on when you need to create an OER. Uh, one of the things we like to say is that creating OER is not a closed book test. You don't sit in a room with a proctor and just come up with only the things that you can in your mind. That would actually be a really irresponsible way to create OER. It wouldn't reference what has come before. It wouldn't include the sort of source material for what you are doing. And so in fact, of course, when you create new teaching resources, you need to draw on the things that have come before, some of which are protected by copyright. So the first thing that you can use freely when you're creating OER, and that I think everyone draws upon knowingly or unknowingly, is the vast majority of things that are in the public domain. So they can, these can be works that are eligible for copyright, but for which copyright has expired. So things that were created in 1925 or published in 1925 or earlier, they can also be things that are just not protectable by copyright. And that's a lot of the really valuable stuff out there. Ideas are not protectable by copyright. So even really good, really valuable new ideas are not protectable by copyright. The things you've written down may be, but the ideas about how to teach history or how to teach algebra or particularly interesting facts about the history and life of Abraham Lincoln, all of those things, the facts, the ideas, you can use those without having to get to any real questions about copyright. The second thing that I think most people who come to OER conferences think about would be materials that are put out under a Creative Commons license. So the CC licenses are intended to give the public a broad permission to use these materials in a huge range of different contexts, as long as they conform to the terms of the license. That most basic term is attribution, um, and other Creative Commons licenses might add a non-commercial or a share-alike term. But what we're gonna talk about today is this third bucket of sources that you can use when you are creating OER. And that is any materials that are currently protected by copyright, as long as you have an understood fair use rationale for including those materials. Fair use is a, one of a set of things that we refer to as limitations and exceptions to copyright. It's the biggest, broadest, and sort of most powerful one in the United States. And what fair use can let you do is say, if I have a new and transformative teaching purpose, a new pedagogical purpose that is different than the original, it can let you take those things and incorporate them into your OER. And that's really important because there are a lot of subjects such as anything that engages with existing journalism, existing history, media, cultural studies, anything that engages with stuff that has already been written or recorded or performed, you need to, to some extent, rely on fair use. And so we're gonna talk about that today. So as I said, there are really um, two core questions you need to ask yourself when you're evaluating fair use. You may have seen these written down before as a four factor test, and that test is in the statute. But in practice, as courts have evaluated fair use, they've really condensed those four factors into a sort of pragmatic two question test, which is first, are you doing something new or different? Something transformative with the material? Was this originally a newspaper article reporting current events and you're now using it to teach the history of what happened in those events, or to examine and critique the journalism itself, the way the events were framed, a change in the way we talk about certain things. So do you have that new and different transformative purpose? And then the second question 
is sort of a check on that, which says, are you using the amount, whether the whole or a part, that is appropriate for what you are doing? And this is important because you may have heard percentage rules. Um, 10%, 10, five pages, one chapter. But those rules, as many people sort of have grown to suspect, don't make a lot of sense outside of a very specific context. You know, what is one chapter of a photograph? What is 10% of a haiku? Like, what if it ends up with like a half a syllable? Do you get like a phonome? And so I think that there are these problems where obviously those rules aren't in the law and don't make sense in the pedagogical practice. And so what you need to do is say, are you reading and examining the whole thing? In most examples for photography, you are examining the whole photograph. And at the same time, for most examples with, for example, a set of encyclopedias, it'd be very hard to say, I have scanned and included all of them, we're gonna read it all. It's probably not the case. And so those two questions, do you have a transformative purpose? And are you using the appropriate amount, whether whole or part, is sort of the core of what fair use looks at. And it's what we're gonna talk about in those practices. And the reason, one of the reasons that that test has worked so well as an evaluation of fair use is that if those two things are true, that new purpose and that appropriate amount, you're not probably providing a substitute for the original in the market, that people aren't going to come to your OER to read the news, right? That if you've taken an article and you've embedded it there, that you're not reasonably substituting for that original market for that newspaper article. So that's where the law stands. And what the best practices are designed to do is to sort of bring together that predictable sort of framework to think about the law with the pedagogical practices of different professional communities, sorry, pedagogical or professional or creative practices. And there's sort of this two-way flow, which is the ways in which communities, whether documentary filmmakers or journalists or librarians, think about their practice and think about those purposes, those new and transformative things they are doing and how they fit into the framework of fair use, sort of feeds into how fair use law understands what the sort of transformative purposes are for their legal analysis. So there's this sort of two-way flow between those communities. And the practices really focus on what are these repeated situations and how do we think about them under the law? And so by providing that framework and then by getting people to rely on fair use, it makes the law itself stronger. And so some examples of that may be thinking about how we teach media literacy and address misinformation. How we, as we said earlier, think about language learning using real world examples. And then finally, and this is something that we'll discuss um, throughout the code and then later in the presentation, how to make sure that the OER you have created is accessible for all of your learners. One of the things we've seen in our research before the best practices was that people who were hesitant about fair use often chose practices like linking out and other downsampling screenshots, other sort of things to hedge their bets that in fact placed a higher burden on students who already had access challenges, students that were already marginalized, and students who they had a legal responsibility to make sure had equal access. And so one of the things throughout this presentation to keep in mind is it's easy to sort of think, I don't know, I think I understand this, but it's new and it's a little bit of work and maybe I'll just be cautious and just link out. And what we want to do is sort of challenge that and say, when you're doing that, you make OER that may be less durable, that link may not work. But more importantly, and more urgently, you're sort of transferring your responsibility for accessibility to the whims of these outside sites. And so if those materials that you've linked out to are useful supplemental materials for some of your students, there is a responsibility to make sure that they are available to all of your students. The good news is that creative, uh, the uh, fair use best practices can give you the tools to do that. So we've talked about the code a little bit, but 
I, before I pass it over to Peter to explain it, I just want to talk a little bit about what it is and what it is not. It's a tool for institutional and individual education for understanding more about fair use. And it's a guide for reasoning through these repeated situations where you may want to use fair use to include third party materials. Once you've done that, it can also be a valuable way to explain why you think this is a good responsible choice to colleagues and to people in your institutions who may function as gatekeepers. And finally, we hope that it's a way to broaden the sort of scope of OER to enable new projects and to bring new makers to the scene. Very briefly, I'm gonna tell you what the code is not. It is not a comprehensive guide to creative to um, copyright in teaching and learning. That would be very useful, but that was not uh, what we had any sort of possible time uh, or staff to create. That would be a you know a multi year project. We'll have the 2030 version of that for you. But um, this instead focuses only on taking things and inserting them into OER as examples and illustrations for resources. It does not focus on course reserves and sort of broader questions about institutional copyright. There are other codes, um, including the uh, code for research libraries that was published with the Association for Research Libraries that will answer some of those copyright and library questions, but that is not this code. The other thing it is not is a comprehensive guide to Creative Commons licensing and OER and how to get the most out of CC licensing. Uh, there's a lot of good information out there through Creative Commons for that, including the Creative Commons certificate. And if you click through to the Creative Commons certificate, all of the teaching materials for this cert are available in uh, downloadable versions. So the cert itself is um, a paid certificate, but all of the teaching materials, all of the resources are available for you to um, use and adapt and reuse in your own institution. And then finally, as I said earlier, because this describes a way of thinking about fair use, it doesn't give you uh, metrics that say you can use this percentage or this many paragraphs or these many pages or some of the image, but not if it's at a high you know, resolution, it doesn't have that. And that's mostly because there really isn't much basis in the law for those. And those rules will always be either over-inclusive or under-inclusive. But we think that the code itself will be a pretty useful tool for recognizing the situations that you see again and again and understanding how fair use can apply. And to talk a little bit about how the code is structured, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Peter Yazzi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Meredith. And I should say that the, the business part of this code, the part that has the, the norms in it, that describes the process of reasoning that we hope you may consider following in making fair use decisions after having read the code is pretty familiar. We've been doing these codes with different practice communities, as Meredith mentioned, for uh, more than 15 years. And in each case, the central portion of the document, the code itself, has the same structure. It begins by describing one of these recurrent situations that we've discovered in our conversations with members of the field come up again and again and pose fair use questions that people are sometimes unable or un unable to resolve or, or or cautious about attempting to resolve. And it addresses that situation by stating a general principle relating to the applicability of fair use to that situation, and then proceeds to itemize a series of more specific, sometimes they're called limitations, this time they're called considerations, things to be taken into account, to be borne in mind in deciding whether the particular instance you're thinking about is one that does fall within the scope of fair use. Then, and, and this is an innovation that we've tried only in a couple of the codes, but um, have certainly made a feature of this one. 
And that is a final section that, that talks about what we're calling here, although we've used different terms in other places, hard cases. That is situations that come up repeatedly and that fall at the, at the edges, so to speak, of fair use reasoning, not excluded, but probably deserving of some additional attention along the way to reaching a conclusion about whether or not fair use does or does not apply. And the other thing I would say as we move on to the next slide is that throughout this document, we use the term inserts to refer to the selected chunks of copyrighted material, large or small, as the case may be, that a, an OER maker may wish to incorporate into their own material. So as we go along, you'll see that term inserts used. As you look at the code itself, which has now been linked in the chat, you will see that term again it has no specific meaning except to designate all of the kinds of situations in which the, the, the author of OER might find it desirable, might find that it would add value to incorporate material from outside. And the first of those recurrent situations is, of course, the one in which you need this insert, this outside, uh, you need this outside copyrighted object as an insert because it is itself going to be the subject of discussion or criticism or close analysis in the lesson that the OER provides. And here we have an example of a, of a short poem quoted in its entirety for the, or a, a, a portion of a poem quoted in its entirety for the purpose of analysis and discussion this is a core example of this particular category. And the principle that follows is a statement that, well, you can read it here for yourself. I'll just gloss it for you. That broadly speaking, inserts for critique and commentary, which are either intended to function as the subjects of critique in the context of the text itself or to invite critique on the part of students or other readers where there's no reasonable pedagogical alternative are without limitation as to medium, without limitation as to the kind of source materials involved, eligible for fair use treatment. And then we come to the considerations. Given that inserts incorporated for purposes of critique and commentary are fair use eligible, what do you have to consider in order to decide whether your instance is covered? And the, the first one reflects the fact that the more context, the more of a framework is provided for the critical reading of the object, which could of course be a text object or a musical object or a visual object, the better. The second is that the, and this goes right back to the core law of fair use that Meredith was describing earlier, the amount of material used should be an appropriate amount, not the least possible, because of course the least possible would mean that the OER as you were producing would always be in a sense suboptimal in terms of their use of inserts, but a justifiable and appropriate one. So the whole short poem, if that's what you're going to be talking about or inviting others to discuss, but perhaps not the whole book of poetry in which that short poem occurs. If you're going to have multiple inserts of this kind in an OER, it's desirable if possible, to draw on a range of source works. And of course, and this is an interesting one, wherever possible attribution should be provided according to uh, prevailing disciplinary standards. 
it, this is an interesting one because you will be, you, if you look at the copyright law itself and the court decisions interpreting it, you can read it upside down and sideways. You won't find any mention of attribution, save in one, and in, in this case, non-relevant portion of the statute. Attribution and fair use don't keep company in technical copyright law. But in a field like OER, it's absolutely clear that the makers of OER believe, as do other kinds of fair users who have been the beneficiaries, if I may use that term, of codes of best practices, they believe that attribution is important, ethically important and pedagogically important. And so we, in our efforts to devise best practices that conform not only to the law, but also to the values of the field, have fallen in line and included proper attribution as a significant consideration in this and other, or under this and other principles of the code. And then we come to the hard cases, which the hardest, I guess, is suppose that rather than producing a, an OER that is itself enriched by selected copyright in inserts, your goal instead is to produce an anthology of material that is available for use in connection with perhaps a variety of different courses in which it will be subjected to critique and commentary. And these are hard cases because of the quantities involved and because of issues that exist around the, the extent of the apparatus that either is and is or isn't provided in such online anthologies. We wanna be clear, these are not excluded cases. There may well be, in fact, I think I would say personally, there is certainly a way of doing this right under fair use, but this may be a case where you wanna speak with your copyright librarian or to speak even with, dare I say it, a lawyer to figure out how to do it right. The next case is perhaps the most ex most common of all of the categories of the use of copyrighted inserts in, in OER and for that matter in other kinds of pedagogical material. And that is the inclusion of items, again, from a full range of sources in a full range of media, not for the purposes of critique, but for the purposes of illustration, to show, to make concrete, to advance an argument by example or illustration. And the case law makes it absolutely clear that illustrative uses of insert material in an educational context are just as fair use eligible as are uses for criticism and commentary. I should add incidentally that not only does the case law make this clear, but the, the, the panel of very distinguished copyright law experts unaffiliated or otherwise unaffiliated with this project, we asked to review our work product before distributing it are of the same mind with respect to this and all of the other principles and considerations of the code. And here you'll see the statement of principle, which I need not reiterate. I think instead I'll move on to the considerations that affect whether or not a particular illustrative use, which is fair use eligible, is or is not actually fair use. And here, the emphasis falls on the, or the emphasis falls initially on the, the burden that the user has to be prepared to explain why an illustration is in fact being used. In the case of an insert for critique or commentary, that may be pretty obvious. In the case of an illustration, it may be that a rationale is provided. 
We're not saying here that you have to write it down in advance or that you have to provide it to somebody in advance or even that you have to write it down for your own purposes, although it might be advisable. We're simply saying that you should have an articulable justification for what you're doing. And uh, to move on to the second consideration, the, the justification that says, well, I think this makes it prettier. I think this makes it more interesting. I think this graphic will catch the eye or this music will attract students' attention. That's probably in itself not enough. Again, quantitative and qualitative appropriateness in terms of the proportionality between how much of an object could be the whole object, of course, but it could also be only a part of the object is used, forms the third major consideration, diversification of sources is here as in the previous principle or as under the previous principle relevant. Attribution applies as well, although we haven't seen fit to write it yet again. And finally, there are some texts and images which it may make sense to incorporate, at least in part, because the actual extent of the copyright protection afforded them, the copyright protection that is subject to fair use, is actually extremely limited. And with that, um, I think that the, well, no, here we have hard cases. And that is, of course, the, 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 the situations that have been most troubling, we've discovered, have been those in which the articulation of a, of a nexus, a connection that it is, exists between the particular illustration chosen and the pedagogical purpose is presented. And again, there, there's no suggestion here that any particular kind of nexus between illustration and pedagogical purpose is required. The suggestion once again is that where that articulate that nexus is difficult to articulate, it should be given special consideration in the fair use analysis, with which I'll turn it over to Will. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, so thank you. You've, we've set the stage really well. Those first two examples around commentary and illustration are sort of bedrock core principles of fair use. Uh, the third principle sort of builds on those and asks about uses that are not about directly commenting on something or illustrating an argument, but they're about practice in some sense. They're inviting students to engage with some, uh, what we call insert in order to build analytical skills, familiarity or fluency. So the example we have here is this uh, Brazilian telenovela. And the question is from someone who's teaching Spanish and they say, I don't just want my students to read the sort of bog standard textbook my name is Will, I go to the library. I want them to engage with the real culture as it actually exists. Talk to me about how I can do that work, how can I can bring those things in, in this context for the teaching of Spanish, but we might get a similar or related question from a political scientist about bringing in newspaper editorials or op-eds that do a similar sort of work. Um, but what all of these questions have in common is this sense of taking something not created for an educational purpose and bringing it in to illustrate sort of how it's done or how it happens in the actual world. And the principle on the next slide says that much more quickly and concisely and clearly than I did. It says basically um, bring that stuff in. Fair use exists for that sort of purpose as well. Um, so that's a third area that's fairly strong. The considerations on the next slide uh, do some of the same work that Peter talked about in the other ones. And I think the, the theme that I see ringing through these is this idea, something we say a lot, good pedagogy is good fair use, yes. right? Um, when you're bringing in these outside materials in order to help students practice or immerse themselves in the real world, bring them in in such a way that they're accessible and available to students and really support that new pedagogical purpose, including things like glossaries, annotations, study questions, really make it clear, this is how I'm asking students to engage with those things. Um, 
related to that, and maybe kind of obviously, but it does need to be said, um, related to Peter's point about illustration, not just for beauty, um, these should not be brought in for their sort of mere entertainment purpose. This isn't, you all were good students all week, so we're going to watch a fun movie on Friday. This was the more deeply pedagogical purposes that we've talked about. Um, again, quantitatively and qualitatively appropriate. Um, and I think sec now, number four is particularly important. These materials should be derived directly from the primary sources themselves, rather than from versions that have been edited or simplified. So if, if what you're offering to students is the real thing, the, the experience with the thing as it, as it exists in the wild, giving them the thing as it exists in the wild is an important part of that process. Um, and then again, as Peter said before, um, when you're bringing in multiple examples, your fair use case is stronger when those materials are derived from a variety of different sources. Uh, so that's the, those are the considerations. On the next slide, we talk some about the hard cases. I wanna say again, what Peter said well, which is these are not no answers, these are the hard cases. And I think that's particularly important to say here because the hard cases that are described related to this principle have more to do with uh, the perceptions of risk that we heard from the community mm -hmm. rather than from a lawyer saying this is a this is a weaker fair use claim. And basically what this says is if you bring in something that's understood as in some sense high value contemporary popular culture, your fair use case might be as strong but but the rights holder is more likely to take a closer look at what you're doing, right? Because there's a there's a different sense of of stepping on an existing market in that sense. So, so to say again, these things are not necessarily a weaker fair use claim, but they are more likely to be challenged. So it's especially important to be able to thoughtfully sort of describe and articulate your pedagogical purpose in terms of fair use as well. So that's the third principle, the sort of practice principle. Um, the fourth principle I like to talk about is the sort of don't reinvent the wheel principle. Um, these questions came from open educators who asked questions related to taking um, existing educational materials from textbooks or other resources that have either outlived their commercial lives in some way, they're out of print, um, or in some other way are not subject to copyright protection. And we'll get into those sort of de minimis Santa Fair things in a minute. But the, the core here is there's this great textbook that was used in 1967. Um, I don't know about the whole thing anymore, but it's got this amazing chart on Spanish verbs. Can, can I just use that chart, especially where there's no rights holder making any claims for it? Um, and the answer here on the next slide is, is the principal articulates this very clearly and consistently. These sorts of resource materials absolutely may be incorporated in reliance on fair use, subject to the considerations on the next slide. And these considerations are important because they talk about some of the things I just mentioned in more detail, this idea that the, the touchstone here is really this sense that these materials are not actively being sort of made available through markets or licensing terms in different ways. These are about sometimes orphan works, sometimes something approaching an orphan work that's still, um, you know, there, there is a rights holder, but they're not commercializing it in other ways. Um, and then as we say here, de minimis quotations, uh, truly such a small amount that a court would say there's not even sort of a copyright claim to be had here. Um, but these are different ways of saying what's highlighted things that are beyond the reach of copyright protection in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, again, the considerations articulate the importance of explaining the specific teaching or learning value of each incorporated item. Um, and if you're doing the work of creating good pedagogy, you're already doing that work. So that's the good news. Um, number four talks specifically about the importance of thinking about a market substitution in the way you talk about that. Um, and then again, this, this theme we've sounded throughout all four of these, diversifying the range of the works that you're sourcing in different capacities. So those are sort of the quick and dirty versions of the four principles. Um, we've shared the code so you can dig in more. And I think we're going to have some time for questions and discussions as well. Um, before we go on to those, though, I wanted to take a quick minute to note that um, at least in terms of pagination and maybe in other ways as well, some of the best stuff out there is in the appendices. There's an old truism in, in the law that the fun stuff, the good stuff is often in the footnotes. And that's true here as well. Some of the really good stuff exists in the appendices that we've included here. So we wanted to point to those and note in those appendices, we have a great summary of what we found about, uh, about OER and copyright in these conversations. I think uh, those are very edifying. A nice, concise account of fair use law. Meredith did a really nice job of setting the table on that. But if you really want to nerd out and go deeper, that, that appendix is really useful. Um, 
a discussion about copyright exceptions and the way they exist sort of around the world, a lot of questions we got was about the idea of downstream use. I'm, I'm okay in the US with fair use, but if this goes to Canada, do I need to be worried? If this goes to the UK or somewhere else, do I need to be worried? So we have uh, one appendix specifically about the way global copyright exceptions are um, harmonized in different ways through the Berne Convention, in particular that right to quotation. Um, and then section four digs even more deeply into the law of Canada in particular and Canadian fair dealing uh, and offers, uh, I think, really strong reassurance from our colleague, Karis Craig, about the way Canadian fair dealing, although it sometimes uses different language, generally gets to the same place, that if, that if fair use generally supports this sort of practice, Canadian fair dealing often does the same. Um, and then section five is sort of a catch-all of other IP doctrines that are relevant, trademark and patent and these sorts of things. So sort of a catch-all for the other questions that we heard that we wanted to be sure we were sharing good information about. So that's, that's maybe enough said about the appendices. I want to turn it over now to my colleague, Prue Adler, to talk about some of the core values that run throughout everything in the code, because I think these are particularly important. So Prue. Um, thank you, Will. Um, so I think there were four key takeaways that we heard throughout this project, um, some of which had been covered previously, but we'd like to bring home. Um, and as Peter mentioned, the first was this very deep consensus that the importance of attribution of sources and clear marking of fair use inclusion or inserts is very, very important um, going forward. And um, prior to this session today, there have been several sessions on equity and accessibility. And in this case, fair use can balance the playing field for all students, for all learners. Fair use is central to ensuring equity and access. And we heard throughout this project that members of the OR OER community support the goal of making OER accessible to all learners, including those with impaired vision, hearing, or physical mobility issues. Um, but we, we also heard that there are concerns about using copyrighted materials that resulted in less optimum OER, even if the copyright inserts that were the most appropriate and impactful um, were not chosen. Selecting an interior, excuse me, an inferior substitute leads to a less than satisfactory OER. It can limit the reach of the OER and it defeats the overall purpose of creating the most beneficial, accessible, and equitable resource for learners. Avoiding fair use further exacerbates the inequality of access by those with disabilities. With greater understanding of fair use, OER practitioners can not only create and adopt the most appropriate digital resources, but it also provides much more flexibility for others who want to adapt OERs. Importantly, it allows for the creation of OERs that are more impactful and can be better meet the needs of all learners, including those with disabilities. Um, what we also heard were concerns about copyright compliance that limit the effectiveness with which OER makers actually employ inserts by slowing down new projects and by driving practices such as linking out of the OER rather than incorporating, and that this reduces the effectiveness and durability of OER materials. Such choices pose particular risks to students with disabilities and other access barriers. Um, in particular, linking out in lieu of using the most appropriate insert, be it text, visual, or audio, as Peter has mentioned, is an example of a key workaround. Such linking out can be linked to proprietary platforms or social media platforms. And it's generally perceived as being a safer approach but in fact, it's more detrimental to the student with disabilities and in fact, all learners. And you know, we all know there's a lot of broken links, uh, change links, uh, links can lead students into directions that the professors or teachers didn't necessarily intend. 
Um, but importantly, a broken link or an inaccessible link means that a student with disabilities and a link that is not accessible means that student has absolutely no recourse in making that resource accessible because they have no direct relationship with the original provider. So one of the things that I think we need to do is think about the legal, moral, and ethical requirements of making OER accessible to students who are not adequately met by reliance on linking. That is not a solution. And we heard that continuously in all of our conversations throughout this project. With that, I think I'm gonna turn it back to Meredith. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so we wanna reserve a few minutes for questions. I think we have um, just about 10 minutes left. Sherry, please correct me if that's not true. Um, but uh, very briefly, I wanna let you guys know what's coming up next and then turn to some questions from the chat. So this code has just been uh, released last month and over the course of the next year to 18 months, what we're gonna do is a mix of general webinars like this where we introduce the code to people, but then relatively soon move beyond that and focus on um, how the code might be implemented and sort of uh, understood at different levels of teaching and in different subject matter uh, communities. So for example, the way in which the code might enable uh, ped improved pedagogy in language learning is different than the way it might in history or political science and is different than the way it might in art or in engineering. And so we're gonna be working with projects where people are creating OER or updating OER or working in their professional communities to uh, create guidelines for people to teach with fair use in the context of OER. So we're we'll looking for those opportunities over the next um, 18 months. So if you're working on a project um, or if you're part of a community that is doing that, please let us know by um, following this link here that we will put into the chat. Um, and then uh, for the next 10 minutes, we'll take questions. One question that I might start with that I've seen sort of throughout the chat is thinking about what subject matter of material, like what sources are eligible for fair use? And so there's been questions about what about federal materials? What about state materials? What about things that are in the Library of Congress or the National Archives? And in thinking through that, I think there's one sort of introductory idea, which is that things that are created by federal employees in the course of their employment are in the public domain. And so for those, you don't even have to get to the question of fair use. But then Peter, do you wanna tell us a little bit about once you've gotten into the world of fair use, once you know this is protected by copyright, are materials treated differently based on who's their author or where they've come from or where you found them? Or are materials generally eligible regardless of their source? Absolutely not. This is a unified field theory in the sense that it is insensitive to source, insensitive to the character of the authorship, commercial, non-commercial, scholarly, popular, insensitive to the type of material, music, text, image, moving image, and also insensitive to the, the, the particular physical or immaterial medium. And that is, I think, it's a message of enormous importance and complete clarity. And so is that true even if you're not sure? So like, what if I find something on the internet and I don't know who the author is? I don't know if it, so, you know, it, it feels like it might've been created by a government employee, but it could have been a contractor, it could have been state. If I don't know, yeah. If Can you're I just skip if into you're, fair use? If you're depending on the notion that it might be a public domain work because created by a federal employee in the course of their duties, then of course you need to know more. 
But if you are relying on fair use, then the particulars, although they may be helpful in arriving at a, a full fair use analysis, are by no means essential. And a work that can't be tracked to a particular source, but the nature of which, the, the original purpose of which, can somehow be gauged simply by the character of the work itself is just as eligible for fair use treatment as one as to which we have the absolute chapter and verse about original creation. It is true, as you pointed out earlier, Meredith, that one consideration in fair use decision making is whether or not a work has been transformed by the user. And so, it is, for that reason, important to have some idea of what the work you are considering using as an insert was when it first entered the world. But the, that's a very different undertaking from the more difficult and challenging and sometimes impossible one of figuring out exactly who created it, when, where, how, under, under what circumstances. Fair use analysis is not sensitive to those considerations. So you just have to do the sort of the workman like, what is my purpose? Is this a new purpose? Am I using the appropriate amount? And that gets you to your answer more than trying to Absolutely. understand different source based Um, I'm going to answer one question that came up in the chat, but that was very important. So I want to speak it um, aloud briefly, which is, you know, how can the code be a tool to um, reassure your general counsel's office? And, you know, the, the law is not generally a place of ironclad guarantees. I would say probably steer away from lawyers who offer you ironclad guarantees as a, as a general rule. But what I will say is the code of best practices gives institutional gatekeepers who are not often themselves copyright experts, a set of understandable, repeatable guidelines that have been reviewed by, if we may brag, a very stellar set of outside copyright reviewers whose um, names and illustrious uh, credentials are listed on the code. But in addition to being uh, colleagues, they're, I think, relatively should be reassuring to your general counsel. Um, and it gives them a way to say, this was a best practices. It was reviewed by these people. It's written down here. If we agree that you're following it, it gives them sort of a boundary to what they are saying yes and no to. And I think what often general counsel are looking for is uh, a clear line, an ability to say, we have said yes to this, but not to everything. And so I think in that sense, the code and the sort of formalities around it can be really reassuring to um, general counsel. And this has in fact proved to be true in the past in numerous instances. This is not merely theoretical. We have examples of people who taking advantage of other codes have successfully made their gatekeepers, including their general counsel, see that the risks associated with not fulfilling the mission of doing good work and teaching well are greater than any risks that may exist around a responsible application of what is, after all, a relatively conservative, centrist interpretation of fair use. Yes, and as Prue said, the risk of having materials that are not reliably accessible for all of your students. I might add, if it's, a, if it's of any reassurance that we've been doing this with different communities for 15 years, and so far, no one, filmmaker, archivist, librarian, et cetera, who's been operating within the four corners of any one of these 15 or so codes of best practices has ever been sued. Period. I'm not saying they haven't lost a lawsuit. I'm saying they've never been sued. So, um, Will, I wanted to turn to you, see if there are any questions that you wanted to particularly address from the chat 
and then maybe talk through one more example to you, with you after that. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback on Peter for just a second and then go to the last example. I just want to say one of the reasons that counsel's offices often get on board and that lawsuits have been especially rare is because what the one of the things the code gives you is a clear statement about your good faith belief yeah. in your fair use claim. And there's a whole, there's a section 504C2, if I ever get a tattoo, that's the tattoo I'm going to get, um, says explicitly that they remit statutory damages. So in a sense, it's better to be wrong about fair use and reliance on the code than it is to be wrong about the public domain or wrong about the provenance of a CC license or anything else. This is not only capacious and supportive, but the safest place to make a mistake. Cool. Um, thank you, Will. And so... We only have a couple of minutes left, but I wanted to just maybe close with a, a example that we've heard questions about in this past year would be to sort of how do you, how could the code work, for example, to um, address teaching and creating teaching materials about current events? Like, you know, thinking through the code, could you, how would you think through the question of could you use a photograph or a newspaper front page or a clip to teach about a current events topic, like about protests or other political issues. I'll start, and then I, I'm sure um, Peter and Meredith, you all have really great things to, to say as well, but I'll, I'll say I love this question. One minute. Okay. Uh, very quickly, I think I love this question because this is sort of the, the highest watermark for the strength of fair use as a First Amendment doctrine, as a doctrine supporting sort of the democratic process, and it's the high watermark for there's not going to be much CC licensed out there about that stuff. If I was creating an OER and I limited myself exclusively to what I could find in the CC search, the protest yesterday, for a million different reasons, is not going to be well represented. So that that to me is that's a that's a great case for both fair use as especially powerful and necessary, and the other buckets that Meredith talked about as especially in need of fair use's strength and support. And I would just add that this is a, a wonderful instance of a. An ex a, a range of cases in which either principle one of the code or principle two of the code, that is critique or commentary, we really want to discuss that image or illustration, we really want to show something because our narrative is going to be stronger by showing it, or both are likely, highly likely to justify the fair use in question subject to the various considerations that the code articulates. Lots and lots of room to operate here. Thank you very much. And I am just dropping um, that uh, link that is on this slide into the chat, which I had meant to do earlier, but had not. Maybe, maybe I'm not. I am. Congrats. On that note, um, thank you all so much for spending the hour with us. Um, we will work with Sherry and the team at Open Texas to make these slides available if they are not already. And um, thank you so much for spending your time with us. Indeed, yes, please be in touch. Thank you. And yes, the slides were available on your um, conference page and I also shared them in the chat. But um, yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll make sure they get to everyone that needs to. Great presentation. Thank y'all. Pleasure. Always fun.